All right, welcome to the June 26th, the Non-Creds V2 Working Group meeting. A um, few topics to go over, presentation data models and predicate types. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, a reminder, this is a Unix, uh, sorry, a Linux Foundation Hyperledger meeting. So the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct as well. The specification that we're creating uh, coming out of these meetings is published under the community specification license, and all of those things are linked in the meeting agenda. Um, so we'll just quickly jump to um, meeting uh, discussions. I do have, I'll just jump into edit mode. Let's see, I've got to clean something up already. So I will do that. Um, don't have any other announcements, so we'll just jump into it. Mike, you want to talk about? I think the the thing we want I wanted to go through was the presentation models and make sure that um, again we we did a pass through those and and I want to see if there's new objects or things to be created or um, sure. Uh, new ones. So I will um, stop sharing and turn it over to you. Oh, okay. All right. I, I mean, I guess I, yeah, probably better for you to call it up and then you can bounce around to where you want to be in that. Okay. Give me a minute. Okay. I'm at the so, airport, so I'm just bringing oh, it up. I, well, I, I can call I, 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 I've got it up now. Okay. Just okay. let me know if I start turning robot. So, it's been known to happen when you're at the airport. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down just to the. Let's see, I think it starts here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, if we look at. Yep. I call them statements. Yeah. These are basically what you want. To be proved in a presentation. Okay. The most basic one is a signature. This is basically saying proof that the data is signed and selectively disclose the following information. So it's either a show, no show, or hide or reveal for each claim. Okay. And that's all it is. And oh, and the third. The third item is from which issuer. So I just put whatever that issuer object happens to look like, which could include the public key, revocation information, what the credential schema is, that kind of stuff. So one of the things that you can do with um, a non credits today is you can say, well, I need it to come from this schema, but I don't care what the issuer is. I don't care who the issuer is. Is that kind of, are you foreseeing that kind of support? You could do that. I okay. highly, I can't imagine a use case where they would say, I don't care who signed it, because then I could sign it. So, <laughs> right? yeah, but the idea there is that instead of, um, instead of doing pre-qualification of the issue where you're basically doing, okay, give me what you got and then I'll decide if that's acceptable. So you get a presentation, you can verify the cryptography, but then you apply business rules. So the, and the use case I can think of right off is I need a, a, a you know, a university, or, you know, a, a, an education credential. There's no way I can list all of the possible issuers I will accept it from. So I'll accept it from any that is a, you know, a degree. And then I'll decide if I trust that issuer. Yeah, so right here, I mean, you, we could rename this, right? The point is, this is the information you need to know where okay. it came from. Yeah, so, so, so similar, like we have restrictions today, which has a list of, I believe it's eight things. Is there any reason not to go down that same eight list? I can you tell me what the eight are? Um, so schema, schema publisher identifier, 
schema, um, schema name, schema version. So those four all relate just to the schema. Okay, um, so that should be compatible. So that shouldn't need to change. You okay. Still do that here. Yeah. Um, you've got the two related to the credential, uh, the issuer identifier and the issuer um, cred def, basically. Mm -hmm. And then the yep. last two relate to specific um, attributes within the credential, which is must contain this, this attribute name and must contain this attribute name with a value. Um, so, I mean, you could apply that for me, the only thing I've needed, and that doesn't mean it's every use case is disclosed, which is like must contain a claim with equals or, or even just yeah. contains a first name. I don't care what that first name is, but they have to disclose it. Yeah. For example. Okay. Yeah. That's all disclosed is and everything else is assumed to be hidden. Okay. So I would say we just go with. Yeah, we go with that. Um, the revocation information, I, I believe that's also in there. Um, yep. Yeah, that's that's what I put right here. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. we could rename this, but I mean, it's schema information, verification, inf cryptographic verification information, and revocation information. So, right. so if you don't put the revocation information in there, I don't know where else you would put it. Yeah. Um, the, so. I mean, one sort of assumption that I think we can make, I well, I don't know. The, the You could just say, you know, anytime, if the credential is revocable, you must include a revocation. You must include revocation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, currently the, the whole revocation interval is really complicated, like it's, it's very confusing for everybody in, in an on-creds one. What do you mean the interval? Like how often it's updated or how well, fresh it no, is? There's a, in, in the request, you can say, I, I, I will accept one in the range of from this time point to this time point. <clears throat> and it's very confusing to people because what it's saying uh -oh. is um, <clears throat> it's basically some sort of optimization around how fresh the revocation can be. That's really all it is. Yeah. That's all yeah. you really care about with revocation is it has to be valid as of a certain period in time. Exactly. And, and, and that rather than being saying, you know, it's as, I mean, it's really only valid at the time point the publication of the data was made. You know what I mean? If, if the if the issuer last published revocation data, you know, six weeks ago, you can't have it any fresher than that because by definition Correct. there is nothing fresher. So right. it gets really confusing. Right. And that's part of like the trust model that's outside the, the scope for this, right? Exactly. Yeah. You might have some issuers that, you know, they are contractually obligated to update every 24 hours or something like that, but you're right. So, okay. So essentially this I, is going to be more or less the same as we had it yeah. as we have today. It really isn't yep. that different. Okay. Excellent. No. Okay. Now keep that, going. And that, was, that, that was the goal I had because when I was designing this, I tried to save as much as possible from V1. Yeah. So it wasn't a completely new thing. The main thing yeah. I wanted to do was just disconnect the cryptography so it could be swappable as needed. But this allows that. So we already yeah. had that for an uncred one. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to the next one. This isn't much different then you have it in the non-creds one, but we only did this for the link secret, but now I'm saying we can do it for anything. Okay. This is like where I'm gonna prove that two claims are the same without revealing them. That's all this does. Okay. And so let's say you didn't wanna use link secret. Let's say you wanted to use my first name to link across. 
or my last name or some other unique identifier. You're not restricted to the league secret. You could be anything. Maybe I want to prove multiple attributes are equal. That's what this would allow. Now, how, how does this relate to whether the schema, one of the attributes is in the same schema or not? So one of the things that, that got added after was the names concept. And in an OnCreds one where you use names and you list a series of attributes, those attributes all must come from the same credential. Are these intended to, how, is there any sort of way for the verifier to say, this must come from the same credential? Is that what statement ID is? Um, they can come from the same credential, but they can also come from a different one. So like, for example, um, maybe like the credential itself is a medical record and you've got yeah. and let's say that's one credential right and so yeah. i'm trying to say all of my kids listed on there all have the same last name right i could do that okay. I, right. I could also say now i've also got four other credentials for each one that is their birth certificate and i'm going to prove that the last name on those birth certificates also matches the last name on this credential so i could do that too so they can be different uh, credential schemas, but they can also be the same. This supports both. The only thing is you just say, it's from this statement ID and it's from this claim. Well, I put label, but you called it name, but it's the same idea. Oh, I see, sorry, and that's a list. I get it. I was thinking it was just two things. Okay, so, so the statement ID is the statement ID uh, as in above. Yes. Where you're it's linking. It yeah, then, so this statement ID oh, is like got it. from like a signature statement. That's how you know the data is valid or yeah. been certified. Okay, so these equalities, these supplement um, a previous one, a previous previous statement. Correct. Okay. So usually, it. so when I'm talking predicates, they usually have to say, hey, the data that is input to the predicate has been certified. Well, the easiest way to do that is with a signature. Yeah, yeah. So right. assuming the signature is valid, then you can do this. So yeah. this is just the equality statement identifier, nothing new there. Then this is saying, let's say this is one signature statement ID, and then you say yeah. first name here, and then you give another one, and it's the same here. So usually you'll have at least two items in this list. Right. <laughs> Any questions with that? Someone had a comment. Claim labels are signatures? No, they're not. Claim labels are just name of, they're like kind of a tag or the name of the claim itself, like first name or last name, age, address, phone number, something like yeah. that, or ID. That's what a claim label is. A signature is over a credential, not over a claim. If you sign one claim, then that is your credential is with one attribute. So, okay. If we're not I have any more questions on that one, I'm going to move on to the membership non members yet. Right. Keep in mind, this was just the initial proposal. It, we can update it. Because you could do set membership or non-membership with accumulators or R1CS or some other way. There's many ways to do this. Accumulators are usually the fastest. But this okay. is a way to say what type it is, one of these two. Yeah. This is the signature statement or a reference of where the claim is gonna get certified from. So that so, references up. Yep, it references like say this one. Yep. So it says the data is coming from here. There's the label, claim label. So let's say it's revocation ID yep. or zip code. And then the rest of this is kind of more like, what are we going to use to check it? So if it's an accumulator, here's the actual accumulator value. Maybe there's a public verification key. Maybe there's some other parameters, whatever the case may be. These next three are kind of subjective to whatever the system is that's using it. 
If you're just taking okay, the accumulator, so you can probably get away with these two. Parameters may or may not be optional, but let's say you're doing bulletproofs, then you might need that. Okay, so what you're saying, I think, is as a verifier, I am going to, so I want to, I want to, we've got a claim label that is state. And I want to know if you are in one of 10 states. Uh -huh. So, so I take those 10 states and I feed them into a function that produces an accumulator. Yes. And then I pass that to you. And what the presentation comes back with is it takes the state and proves it's in or, or not in that state. Correct. So let's say the issuer said, all right, here's how I map the states to an accumulator. Anyone could say, okay, I'll do the same thing. Like, like I was saying kind of last time, disaster zone. The issuer yeah. for my driver's license says, I map them just by, let's just say hashing it, because that's easier. They're just going to hash the state. That's public information. So then FEMA comes out and says, well, the hurricane just hit the East Coast. Yeah. We're going to say the following states in the U.S. Um, were hit and make an accumulator and use the same mapping as issuer A, ACME. Then anyone who lives in those states without changing any of their credentials can then prove that they're in the disaster zone or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. That's wild. Okay. And and they can do that because they know it's in it. the well, they the reason they can do that is because the, sorry, the, they know it's an enumerated set. They know it's an enumerated set, and the verifier has said, this is how I determine the entries in the enumerated set. Right. And, and they can do that either fully explicitly. They can list out, you know, here are the 50 states. And then the other one takes that enumeration, does the same calculation to come up with the accumulator of accepted ones, and then membership or non-membership can be proven. Okay. That's right. The That's other wild. way you could do this is you could do it with an R1CS circuit. A little more complicated, but you could use it to do the same thing, right? Yeah. All I'm saying is, regardless, there is a set out there you're proving you're in or not in that set. And as we saw from the work um, Aritra did last week, these are not, accumulator does not have to be made up of primes for some reason. I uh, always thought- No. No, elliptic curves, elliptic curves don't have to contain primes. Okay. They just That's have to correct. contain valid, valid uh, elements in the field. The only the only accumulator that needs primes is an RSA based block. Oh, okay. I see. So because ND one, you know, uses it in a an elliptic curve, they're just points. Yeah. Okay. That's all they are. That's crazy to me. Like I thought that was the, you know, like as little cryptography as I know, the math, the simple math was, oh, if the accumulator is made up a bunch of primes, then if the prime's missing, then you can tell that. But now you're telling me they're not even primes? That seems crazy. Not for an elliptic curve. All right. I believe you. <laughs> and so the, the, well, the security of it comes from the fact that, you know, you've got two to the 256 power possible values that could be in there. So it's impossible for someone to enumerate and try to check which ones are yours, right? It's just too large to find it. Okay. All right. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's accumulator membership. And then, and, and basically what happens is depending on how it's signed, the accumulator is is done the same way, but depending on whether it's PS or BBS plus or or whatever, the 
the calculation can be performed for presentation to present and to verify, right? Yes, it, the, it, the signature actually doesn't matter as long as it's compatible with the accumulator. So for example, um, CL signatures are also compatible, even though they're RSA based. Okay. It just, because those three signature types mm -hmm. um, also are signatures over commitments or a, you know, just a, re a regular value. And that's all like, for example, an elliptic curve accumulator or an RSA based accumulator require to do a proof. Okay. And all that the, to create a presentation of this, you're just sending over the signature of the value. And then on the yeah. other side, they're figuring out their, oh, oh, sorry, no, the, the verifier sends over the enumerator or sorry, the accumulator and Correct. the, and in creating the presentation, the holder can tell if they've met that condition, if they're in the accumulator. Yeah, the, the holder will know okay. before they even do the presentation, <laughs> right? And if they're not, like, say, the no-fly list, then they could, you know, go, oh, crap, I'm going to get dinged but, or whatever. <laughs> right, but, the, but the, the verifier is not sending over the actual list. It's only sending an accumulator, right? That is correct. Okay, so it, but it can still, but the holder can still do the calculation itself to figure out if if their value is. The holder can, yeah, because they can yeah. prove and verify if they had to. What what I wanted to be sure there in asking that was that the 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 verifier isn't sending over the list of twenty two states. It's sending over. No, they cumulative. don't have to. Exactly. Okay. Good. If they're doing say R one CS, they might have to send over all the states, but that's why I think the accumulator is the better option because you don't need yeah. to. That's let's awesome. Say, let's say it was, let's say if there was a billion items in that list, trying exactly. to send all that over is going to be very bandwidth intensive. That's exactly what I was thinking. That's where I was going. <laughs> By sending just the accumulator, it's really simple to send it across. Then the verifier, the holder doesn't even need, really need to know. It just needs to, am I in it? That's right. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. A commitment. This is like one use cases for the domain proof idea, right? Yeah. Where you register, you create something that's unique for that specific domain, and you want to prove that you are a return visitor versus a brand new one. Oh, okay. That's one use case for this. That's one use case. For this. The other okay. is, um, some other proofs require conversion to a commitment rather than a Schnorr proof, which is how like CL, BBS plus and fungible standards all work. So in that, or like, let's say you're doing ECDSA, right? That's just a regular value. And let's say you want to link it to R1CS and that requires uh, a commitment. This is how you would do it. I, you and I have talked about how, like, that's how bulletproofs works. Bulletproofs takes commitments, not mm -hmm. Schnorr proofs. So okay. this is kind of one of one of those. Now, if you wanted to say, yeah, domain proof, you could just stop here with this. So the domain proof for a commitment is similar to what we've seen before. Where what's the value that you're going to prove? Make sure it's signed. That's what this is for. So you reference a signature statement. What's the claim? And then because we deal with uh, blinded commitments, you need two generators. One is for the claim itself and the other is for what I call a randomizer. Another term is a blinder. I'm not, I'm not entirely sold on the nomenclature for this yet. I like randomizer, but blinder is also. I just think blinder confuses people whenever I yeah. say, oh, it's the blinding factor. They're like, wait, what's that? So yeah. I try randomizer because I think people understand what that is. And if they went to my presentation, they would understand it. <laughs> well, they should have. <laughs> um, okay, so from a business perspective, domain, domain name, or sorry, a domain proof, 
is there any other business perspective on that? If you go the, you know, you mentioned there's two types. The domain uh, proof, um, the second one. I could, uh, the second one is like, let's say you wanted to do bulletproofs or which are range proof. Sometimes you have to link out to, to a different, using a different crypto. And that's how you would do it with it. But but would a verifier have to know that? Yes, they would. Now you could add, you could hide that, right? You could say, "Hey, I will accept the range proof from bulletproofs, or maybe some other thing." And so, if if you've got a CL signature, in order to get it to a bulletproof, you're going to have to do this, and that's fine. Okay, let me come back. I, uh, sorry, I want to revisit this. So a domain proof, the verifier gives a value, which is the claim generator. They give two values, okay. They give and both of these, right? They give both of These are of the them. only things the verifier would have to give. Well, they'd say which one, which claim label they allow, and two yeah. generator points, as long as these aren't the same. Okay, and then what they get is a consistent signature blinded a consistent blinded signature that as long as they pass the same claim generator and randomizer they get the same string back right mm, kind of think of it this way i can i can post this link because this is public okay here's what i call it it's called a commitment twin proof where you're basically saying i have two commitments and I'm going to prove that they hide the same value. So in the domain proof, when you register, you're going to create one commitment. And whoever that is is going to store it. Then whenever you revisit, you're going to prove that you know the two values that were hidden. That's what this does. So that way, the proof looks different each time, but you're still indicating which domain proof to check. This this link is public if you want it, Stephen. Okay, I'm still trying to translate this into language that I know, not, and that's why it's so not hard. Cryptography <laughs> language. So I know. What, what I'm trying to get out of this is, I get that that the same credential was used, or the same attribute value was pulled from the credential yep. every time. Yep. I don't get to see what the value is of the attribute. Presumably, I don't disclose it, but I do know Correct. that I've seen that one before, and so I can correlate it with one I've seen before. That's right. Okay. Which basically gives you that ability to have a unique identifier, but not share that unique identifier, but the but the verifier knows when the same unique identifier comes back. That's right. The great thing is, yeah, with the domain proof, I can use that same unique identifier across domains, but it won't look the same to anybody observing. Like Acme Bank, even though I did yes. a okay, I got proof it. to them yes. versus the British Columbia government. Exactly. I might register the same ID, but because it's hidden behind a commitment, right? And the and the parameter information, these two things um, are specific to that domain. They yep. can't tell. And as a holder, I could detect that. Oh, this is the same. They've used the same values as somebody else. Therefore, they are able to collude if they want to. Right. The holder could look at these and say, have I seen these two before? Exactly. Right. Yes, they could. Okay, good. Okay. Yep. And that's the only, is that the only use of this commitment? No, as I've been saying, like if you need to link out to other systems that may require something other than what PS 
BBS plus and CL signatures required. This this also works. Like I said, okay. range proofs. Range proofs, you can't just take them as is from those three signatures. You have to do some translation, and this is the way to do that. Okay. But you can't give me a use case where I would do that other than just to say yeah. range using something other than well, CLC. <laughs> well, for example, there are no range proofs supported by elliptic curves right now, okay. as is. So, okay. so in order to do that, like bulletproofs is a way to do that. But bulletproofs takes a commitment, which is what this gives you. So I would have something signed by BBS Plus. Yeah. I would take that value and make a commitment proof and say the same value that was signed in the credential is in this commitment. Yeah. And bulletproofs will go, okay, I can take that same commitment and I can also generate a range proof over the same value to say, okay, let's say it's my age. So I make a commitment to my age. Bulletproofs then goes, okay, I can take that age commitment and prove it's greater than 18. Okay, so let me propose that we do this. Suppose, even though it's got the same values, can we break this into two sections, domain proof and bullet uh, range proof? They already are. So range proof comes down is down below right here. Okay. So I've got range proof the, right here. Okay. But it uses essentially the same technique you're saying. Yep. Okay. So this one we would rename to domain and then we've got range down below. Right. Well, range, like I said, range takes as input a reference to this commitment statement. It needs to know that because it can't take just the value from the signature. Okay. It has to do something else to it first. So it says, this is the signature that it's coming from. So I know it's certified, but okay. then I also need to know where's that commitment that took it from the signature to this value. Cause that's what I have to use. Oh, I see what you're saying. So in other words, I've got to have a commitment and then I do a range proof and I reference Correct. back to the commitment. That's right. But another way to do that would simply be to replace that reference to a commitment and, and simply say the same things that are in the commitment in here. Yep, you could do that too. Yeah, I think that would be easier. That's fine. Yeah, got it. Okay, that makes sense to me now. Thank you. Okay, variable encryption, verifiable encryption. Yeah, as I've talked about before, this looks identical to a domain proof. The difference is instead of a randomizer generator, you have an encryption key. And you're essentially proving that you've encrypted a value to this encryption key. So whoever owns the corresponding decryption key could decrypt it. Right. But to verify the proof, they don't need the, that decryption key. They're just saying, okay, I can check that you encrypted a value that was in your in your credential, a claim, you encrypted a claim. And so it's the same value in the credential and you encrypted it to this encryption key. Yep, got it. <clears throat> and the use case there is um, somebody, an issuer, somebody else gives you, a, gives the verifier a public key. They pass the public key in this encryption key field. And the result is they get a, an encrypted data value that only someone with a private key can decrypt. That's right. Okay. There's a couple of use cases for this. Let's yeah. say that you wanted them to have some reporting system. Let's yeah. say I got a claim from BCGov yeah. or a credential from BCGov. Yep. And, I, and anytime I use it, part of that proof says, you need to send me a verifiable ciphertext, which is what this gives you. Yeah. It says if I were to take that verifiable ciphertext back to BCGov, they would be able to decrypt it to know who you are. Obviously, I wouldn't know who you are, but they would. Yeah. So they could do that. 
So in that case, BCGov is also supplying the verified vote encryption key, even though they are the issuer. So there's no external third party. Yeah. But it's a way and that another, if they needed to unmask you, they could. Yeah. Another thing that this should have is it should either be an encryption key or a reference to an encryption key. So sure. this could be a did, a did with a hash key one, you know, a hash to the key. I assume I assume all keys that I've listed here could also be did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Ultimately, they're all going to just be resolved anyway. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But that way, they, there's no question where the key came from. You can say, you know, you're not you're not accepting the, the key from the verifier, you're accepting a resolvable identifier to, to get the key. And therefore yeah. you can tell, oh yeah, this is the BC gov um, key. That's right. Yeah, okay. Very cool, very cool, okay. I did not list verifiable decryption Although that is something we, else we can also do. <laughs> it's just not a very common use case for it. I've only seen it used in like more complicated protocols outside of a non-cred. I have yeah. yet to see a use case for it inside a non-cred. Okay. So I didn't add it, but we could just as easily add it if we wanted. And that is that the issuer issues it encrypted. And yeah, yeah. So you can think of it as the issuer gives it to, gives you an encrypted value that only you can decrypt. Yeah. But both sides would know what the value is. So the issuer goes, "This is the value I encrypted," and then you get it, you decrypt it, and you, then you then you return a proof and say, "This is the value I decrypted." I got after I decrypted, and the issuer can say, "Yes, that's correct." Yeah, but kind in of a like third a party scenario, that's weird. Exactly. That's why yeah. I didn't put it in here. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. Okay, excellent. All right. There are and other proofs that we could do, but I think this covers everything. Yeah. And then the range proof is the last one. Um, and yeah. range is this, and, and the predicate we have today is also covered by range, right? It should. It just works yeah. a little different and a little faster yeah. than, than how it's currently done. This supports this. What I want yeah. is that this range could be the same one used in the current one, but could also be a newer one. OK. So it's more flexible, because right now the yeah. current one is restricted to CL signatures. Yeah. This one should be anything. Could okay. be bullet proofs, could be R1 CS, could be anything. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. Okay. And then what have you got down presentation request statements? I've got a schema, a presentation request schema. Yeah. It's just a list of statements that you want proof. That's it. That's literally all it is. Yeah. I did not put an ID and there could be an ID like, but I usually assume that let's say the presentation request schema is anchored somewhere that could be anchored to a did, it could be anchored to a block hash. I don't really care. Yeah. Um, um, so originally I was thinking that when we had that, it would have to come from one credential, but by definition, this could come from multiple credentials. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And if that happens, you just have two statements with signatures, right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And then this is just the data that is returned. I call them proofs. Yeah. Right. There's a signature proof, inequality proof, the set membership proofs, and then obviously I didn't carry on, but there you have one for each one. Okay. Oh, that was a huge help. 
I mean, there's, there's other proofs that we could do, like one is called set intersection. That one gets a little complicated, and I'm not sure it's needed yet. Yeah. Because I think we can cover just about everything else with what we've got. Yeah. That should handle probably 98, maybe even 99% of use cases. Okay. That's awesome. All right. Well, I got a lot out of that. Richard, I hope you did as well. Um, moving on to other things. I am really buried this week. I will try to, I'm, I've got on my list to try to come up with a, a plan, um, a reacher for the work you're, you're doing and, and moving on. I think we're ready for the, oh, I did want to have a discussion actually, if you don't mind with the two of you, um, that idea of, Mike, did you follow the conversation about the, um, um, the issuer or the holder providing the, what we're now calling the entropy variable? Uh, kind of. I was trying to figure out still exactly what the use for it. Because you said like it was partially there for legacy purposes, but do we need it All going I know, forward? What I know is that in Indy, there's this, in the Indy implementation, so going back to, you know, Indy SDK and, and CredX, there's this value called issue or holder did that the holder provides. Um, a holder did makes no sense in a non, in a non creds perspective because there's no such thing as a did. So we traced it along and it turns out that it is basically used to, to provide entropy. And so why a reacher, can you Around. help with that? <laughs> can you help with that question? It, well, is it coming from the verifier or the issuer? No, the holder is holder supplying it, it doesn't make currently sense. Currently, it is coming from the holder. It's coming from the holder? Yes, yep. currently. Currently, the holder hmm. is providing it. So, yeah, so I, I was thinking that uh, the holder can provide anything, like uh, any random string or or the DID. So, the thing or is nothing. that in... So, maybe they're using the DID only as a random string. That is what I guessed from the code I saw. Are they like That's hashing true. it or intruding it in like a transcript somewhere? Yeah, I think they hashed it one time. I'm, I don't remember actually, but yeah, they did something with that, with the string. So, so the, the holder provides it in the um, credential request. And then as far as I know, the issuer takes the value and hashes it. And yes. then add it to some other information they have and uses that in the signing. Yeah, that's not really needed. I mean, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it weakens security, but it also doesn't enhance it either. <laughs> it's just kind of there. So, so the two thoughts came from it. One, so, so one, <laughs> So what we did was we at least renamed it when we when we did it when we did the actual an on cred specification we renamed it because we thought it was inappropriate to call it the holder did when that has no no meaning unless you're using you know didcom or something like that it has no meaning we called it entropy for lack of a better <laughs> name but the question is should we simply in the issuer ignore whatever value is put by the holder in there and simply generate a random number is it well like i said there's really no need for it if it's going from holder to issuer if it was holder to verifier i could see that being like self-attested place no this but that's is not the case holder, here holder to issuer then to me, there's no need for it. I say we get rid of it. It's just confusing and it really doesn't add anything except complexity. Okay. So if, if we can, I'd love to drop it. 
Okay, so I will. Um, a Richard, could you basically write up an issue that that captures the flow of that field and basically yeah. propose that you know the presentation request could continue to have either of those values, but they will be ignored and we we update the implementation to simply have the issuer do what it needs to do and not involve the holder. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Well, okay. Here, here's a thought I just had. Maybe the holder wants to say this is a unique interaction request from me to the issuer. And maybe wants some unique identifier per it, you know, for an interaction. That's okay. about the only use case I could see for it. But again, it adds nothing to the security model. It's purely for like uh, auditing purposes. So you can say, hey, here's the unique identifier I sent over to the issuer. The issuer honestly could do anything they want with it. They could completely drop right. it. They Which could do anything. To do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why I think let's just get rid of it. Because I don't see how why the holder the holder can do anything they want to track the fact that they got issued a credential. For one thing, they're going to have a credential they can track. Um, right. Well, and there's there's two things you can't really hide, no matter how much encryption you deploy. One is time, right? Yeah. Both sides are going to be able to see it. Yeah. And two is location, right? Somehow the packets all have to route back to the to the source <laughs> on both sides. So yeah. those are two things you can't really hide. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, from there, I'm going to look through. Um, I would like to get Mike. What's your schedule over the over July? Are you working or holidaying or? Yep. No. Yeah. So this week I'm traveling. So this okay. week I'm a little slammed. But next week. There's a U.S. holiday on Tuesday. I might be out Monday as well. Yeah. But otherwise, I'm more, I'm planning to work. Okay. So I'm going to set up a meeting for the three of us, say, a week Wednesday. Sounds um, good. So, I can do that. Uh, Reacher, can you make that? Maybe he went to bed. <laughs> you there? Fine. July 5th, can you make that a meeting then? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Stephen, I suggest we go a little on the early side. So yeah, this time is fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. fine. Oh, I was, I was going to suggest two hours earlier if, if that's possible. Yeah, could we do, uh, yeah, two hours earlier. Is that good for you, Aritra? That would work for me. All right. Uh, which time? Can you just repeat which time? Um, I'll July, send a note. July 5th. Yeah, July 5th, two hours earlier than this time. Okay, okay yeah, fine for me. Okay, good. Great. Excellent. Okay, I'll set that up. I, I will um, have a plan for um, the rest of it and a proposal for um, meetings for the rest of the mentorship. Cool. Thanks, Stephen. Fantastic work so far, that's for sure. Much appreciated, yeah. really good. Great, Aritra, great level of conversation. Okay, just, thanks all. Just, just real, well, just real quick, Aritra, do you have anything for Stephen and I? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nothing as such for now, so. Okay. Yeah, that's, okay. Anything if you need comes anything, up, please. I will, yeah, I will write yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Good. Okay. Have fun in Montreal, right. Mike. I will. I'll eat tons of poutine for you. All right. Good. Take care. <laughs> See ya. Okay. See ya. Bye.